Welcome to Hispanic Biz Success Stories. We interview business owners who built successful businesses who contribute greatly to our community. We hope that these stories are encouraging, enlightening, and inspiring. We're very fortunate today to have with us um, a wonderful El Paso businessman uh, who's now, of course, has national fame. Uh, Mr. Fred Loya is with us and his wife, Mrs. Maria Loya. We appreciate that very much. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Loya, for being with us this, this afternoon. Well, thank you, Omero, for inviting us uh, to be on your outstanding program. And we hope that our presence here is of value to those who come after us in, in business. And thank you. It's certain, <coughs> you're, certainly, you're certainly a valuable asset to our community. Let me ask thank you, you, Mr. Loya, uh, what role do you play now in your business, Fred Loya Insurance? Well, there's two ways of looking at it, Omero, I guess. Uh, one way, the way I look at it, is I serve as an advisor to the executive officers of the company who are my son, my daughter, and uh, a young man who's been with us quite a few years now, since he's, actually since he was in high school, and he's chief operating officer of the company. My son is the chief executive officer, and my daughter the president, and the chief financial officers. Those, those are the main officers of the company, and those are who I view my role as being one of advisor whenever they ask for it, and sometimes when they don't ask for it. I guess another way of looking at it would we just say I, I really just play a ceremonial role. <laughs> well, that's uh, that, that's that's important, especially with men of your stature. Let me ask yeah. you. Well, so how li how large is the company today? Oh, the company is. Uh, I think our premium volume is around six hundred million. Uh, we have three thousand employees. Uh, we operate in nine states, and we're licensed in twenty three, into which we will expand as uh, as we see uh, convenient to do so. And all that grew out of El Paso. All that came out of El Paso, out of Northeast El Paso. Yes, sir. Well, let's get the story. Let's 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 understand a little bit about uh, Mr. and Mrs. Loya. Um, you're not from El Paso. No, sir. I'm from. I was born in uh, Santa Ana, California. I went to school there, both high school and college. I attended Modern Day High School in uh, Long Beach State. I graduated from there in uh, 1960. And then I went uh, after that. I, I, I left California for the Army. At that time, uh, service was mandatory. It was a, the, draft, the draft was in place, and uh, so I had to go. And, and I, I decided, to, instead of going just two years, which was the draft obligation, to go three years, because that way I could choose uh, where I wanted to be stationed, and, and uh, there was going to be no National Guard meetings to attend, which would have defeated the purpose, because I felt that once I did my service, I had done my duty to my country, and I would go to Mexico to do what I wanted, which was run my parents' ranch. So I, I went for three years uh, to the Army, and I served in Germany. So in 1963, I went directly to Mexico, and uh, by this time I had met Mrs. Loya, and she was waiting for me, Maria. Mm. Uh, and then we got married a year after I got out of the service uh, in 1964. Wow. And we ran the ranch, had two children down there, my, my daughter first, 1965 and then my son, 1966. Uh, and we had intended to stay, but unfortunately in, in the early 70s, the price of cattle just fell through the floor, completely collapsed, and it left us in a very precarious and difficult position of, of, of really struggling to make a living after living fairly well for, for those intervening years. And a friend of mine who, who worked for an American cattle company and was a buyer down there, uh, moved back to El Paso because there was no cattle to buy. There, there was very little cattle movement as opposed to what there had been. And here they talked him into becoming a farmer's insurance agent. And I came to visit him uh, in 1974. And I, you know, in talking, I told him, hey, well, you know what I can do and what I can't do. Maybe some opportunity will o open itself up here in El Paso. And, and you know, just let me know. I mean, you, I might be able to do it for a couple of years till cattle prices come back. And he said, well, why don't you be an insurance agent? And I said, well, that really doesn't uh, appeal to me. And that's a story in itself. I don't know if you want me to go into it. It's just, I find it one of the interesting stories in my life, and that is that my parents had a, a tortilla factory when I was growing up in the early years of, of primary school, of elementary school. And my father, around three, four in the morning, would bang this pole uh, where the factory was right below my bedroom, and he would tell me it's time to get up, and I'd get up, and I'd go count dozens of tortillas. You know, I just counted from one to 12, and that was my job, and we stacked them up, and then he 
packaged them and we sold them. And so this went on until I was in the seventh grade and after that he sold uh, the business and you know, well, whatever that continued. But I remember when I went to, to Long Beach State uh, and, and, and they assigned me a counselor and, and, and it was time for her to go over the, the results of my, my exams or my entry exams or whatever, my placement exams, I guess, with me and, and I asked her, I said, how'd it go? I said, how'd it go with me? You know, I told my name's Fred Loya. I said, how'd it go? And she said, well, let's put it this way. She said, if you're, you know, there was a, two questions on the test that I still remember. One of them was, you know, where does a boat sit lower in the water, in fresh water or in salt water? I had no idea, you know. And the other one was, was, was a diagram of a lot of pulleys on this page and, and they had a rope going in one end and it said if you, you know, you, the rope goes like this and this, which way are the pulleys going to go? You know, and then at the end you put down, just put arrows on how the pulleys are going to turn, what direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. And, well, I remember those two questions, but, but then the, the counselor asked me, uh, what does your father want you to do? She said, I said, I asked her, how did it go? And he said, well, let's put it this way. If your father wants you to work with your hands, you're going to starve to death. I said, well, I guess I didn't do too good on that pulley question. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, actually, he wants me to be an engineer. Wow. And she said, well, how good are you with math? And I, you know, by this time I knew that this had gone downhill and there was, there was no remedy to it. So I said, I can count to 12, yeah. I told her. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, I have a suggestion for you. You should either consider being a used car salesman or an insurance agent. Really? These were the two most wow. despised professions of, oh. the, of our generation. I mean, you know, college poll after college poll, when asked what is the most, the worst thing that you can be, you can view yourself doing in professional life was the worst was used car salesman and the second worst was insurance agent. So that's what and the college counselor tells you. This was the polls, but then that's what she suggested to me and I said, oh, oh my God, I'm out of here. Oh, geez. So I went on to, I, I finished, I took a business, you know, I, I, I majored in business and my degree was a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. But, you know, right now I wonder, Omero, oh if, if had I taken her up, I would have got a you know, 12, you know, 14 year head start on, on, on the <laughs> profession that I did eventually take, and of which I'm very proud. Because you were at the Cattle Ranch for 12 years, 11 yes, years. Yes, from 1963 uh, yeah, to 75. What did you learn from your father? Well, I learned, you know, we, what a lot of us learn from our parents, I think, you know, ethics. A uh, good work ethic, uh, treat people honestly, you know, work hard, and eventually stick with, with to your goals and uh, be persistent in the pursuit of what you want to do. Uh, focus on what you're doing and, and eventually it'll work out for you. So you worked um, with him uh, 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 even through college maybe? No, no, I, I didn't really work with him. He, uh, he, he, was, he started to run the ranch in Mexico and we stayed in California, oh, my mother okay. and I. And, and so, no, I, I didn't have the fortune of really working with him. I just had the memory of the lessons he taught me until, uh, you know, through high school and, and through my first and second years of college. Um, and your mother? What was, what was your mother like? My mother was a, was a, a, a school teacher. Okay. So she, she brought with her uh, an education that, and, and again, a, a commitment to, to to doing good for others and giving back to the community through teaching, in her case, and but but still inspiring me to give back in one way or another to the community that we lived in and, and, okay. and, and in which we prospered in. Were there a lot of Hispanics in Santa Ana when you were there? Yes, yeah. yes, there was already a lot of Hispanics. Uh, and when you went into the military, you say your father after after college, or your father passed away when you were in, in college, or yes, when I was in college. Yeah. He passed away in 1960. Wow. Um, when you went in the military, it's interesting, I went in the military in 62 and decided instead of taking the draft, I served four years. Uh, you know, I wanted to prove my allegiance. Right. I don't know. <clears throat> but I, I chose and I became a musician so I could, I could choose my what, MOS, my, my, right. my career field. What did you do in the military? I was a, a payroll clerk, a finance clerk. Okay. Uh, and we, I was in charge of preparing the payroll for two battalions wow. in Germany. What did you learn in the military? Well, in the military, I also learned to at least get to work on time. That was one thing. I mean, for whatever reason, we had officers that really, really 
uh, were hung up on us being on, on to work on time. So when you were in the military, were you already through with college? Yes. Okay, and you went in as a... As, as, as an enlisted man. Yeah, I've always had eye problems. I mean, I, I never had adequate vision to to okay. pass any of the exams required for to be, become an officer. Okay, I didn't know that. <clears throat> and so when you come out of the service now and you're degreed, and your father had this ranch in Chihuahua. Mm -hmm. Where in Chihuahua? In uh, uh, Chihuahua, in the state of Chihuahua, about 100 miles southwest of the city. Uh -huh. So Chihuahua is about, what, 220 miles, 250 miles south of here. The ranch would be 320, 350 miles. How, how big a ranch was it? Well, it wasn't, as ranches go in, in Mexico, it was relatively small, about 10,000 acres. Okay, and so, so you go run this ranch now, and mm -hmm. your mother stays back in California? Or? Yes, she stayed in California until she started getting sick in the, uh, I guess, late 60s, and then we, we went and got her and, uh, and brought her back to live with us in Mexico. Okay, and you'd already met your lovely wife? Yes, we had met in 1960 before I went in the Army, and we got married in 1964. Wow, and uh, and uh, and Mrs. Loya has been a support to you all these years. Yes, Mrs. Loya also comes from a very hard, with a hard working background, very very committed credentials. She was uh, her father passed away when she was fourteen, and she was really essentially left in care of her mother, a younger brother, and sister. Wow. So she she was working very hard uh, during that those years until we got married, and after that we continued to help that family as best we could. Uh, but at the time that we got married, she asked me if she wanted, if I wanted her to be a housewife or a partner in business. And we lived out in a ranch, and I said, well, we can afford a cook, you know. I said, we, we can afford that. And I said, and then I felt that putting her in the kitchen would just be the death of her since, you know, she had really essentially always lived in, in working, in a working environment and never in the kitchen. I said, no, oh, we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, and besides that being, I think, I'm, uh, as I'm sure that you know, once you're in the service, you get used to eating just about anything. I mean, you don't have a lot of hang-ups about uh, highly elaborated foods or, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that special. So, and so it, she it, started it, working with me since then. At the early start, she, she started helping you. In yes, the, right what, away. And, and what did Mrs. Loya do for you there at the, at the ranch? What did, what well, at the ranch, she would, at first, you know, she would, she would ride the range with me on, on the horses. And wow. we would, uh, you know, we would do the work that's required in the ranch. You'd fix really? fences, wow. brand cows, and uh, cure them, and uh, round them up. And, She's out and there that. in the field with you? Yes. Wow. And then, then she, she, we set up a, a store there in the town where we lived. And after that, she, she started running a, a little store mostly okay. more than helping me on the ranch. But she also, I understand, also she served on a, a committee of cattle ranchers. What was that? Okay, uh, all, all states in Mexico have a cattlemen's uh, union, and then each of the counties usually has a cattlemen's association. And, you know, we, we were active in the local cattle association of our county, or municipios that are called mm -hmm. down there. But Mrs. Loya was elected to the board of directors of the Chihuahua State Cattlemen's Union, wow. and she was the only woman up to that time, and I think today to ever serve on the board of directors mm -hmm. of the Cattlemen's Union, and Chihuahua's Union is the biggest in the state, in the country. Wow, yes, that's that pretty, pretty significant. They would, yes. they would accept a, yes. a woman on their and board. And those were very chauvinistic times, very macho, and it was a very macho <laughs> environment. Yeah, but you defended yourself very well. Yes, she did. I tried hard. <laughs> no, she did very well. That's, that's, that's neat. So, so the cattle prices start falling in the 70s. Yes. And... Uh, and so it hurts. It hurts your business. So what did you? What did you have to do then? Well, the, uh, we were just going to tend the cattle for two years. We, we we could see that we were going to be able. To, the cattle prices wouldn't rebound for at least two years. This is 1974, and then we were. It was a severe drought year, uh, and so I mean we were just. We knew that we were in for a hard time, and when uh, my friend offered me the opportunity to, or suggested that I come up and be an insurance agent with him for over till prices turned around. I said, well, why not? You know, and I, uh, when he talked me into it, I, you know, I didn't go home that day back to Chihuahua where Maria was waiting for me. And she called and she said, well, why didn't you come home? I said, well, no, I'm not going home. I said, I'm not going back. He said, well, what do you mean you're not coming back? I said, no, I'm going to be an insurance agent. Oh my God. She says, no, no, we're going to, you're crazy. We're going to starve to death. <laughs> 
because she also worked for an insurance agent at the time, oh, okay. a life insurance agent. He was very refined, he was very cultured, uh, very educated, uh, very well-rounded. In other words, she was telling me he's everything that you're not. <laughs> 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 so I don't see how you can ever make it. But I went back and we talked it over. And actually, it was her family who convinced her that what harm okay. can be done? You know, you go up there for one or two years, and if it doesn't work out, what's lost? I mean, because uh, if you don't go in, you're just going to stay here anyway. Wow. <clears throat> so, when, what, what, what brought you to El Paso in the first place uh, at that time? Well, it was that friend of mine mm -hmm. who, you know, that, that had been buying cattle down there and was my boss for this cattle company that he worked for and which, for which we bought uh, large amounts of cattle in all of central Mexico. This had nothing to do with the ranch. This was a separate job that I had with him, and he came to El Paso because it was the closest American city to Chihuahua City. And, um, and so when I came to see him, I came here because this is where he was. And, but uh, by that time, he had already become a, a farmer's insurance agent because they talked him into it at his church. The church had several agents there okay. for that company. <clears throat> so Cattleman becomes a... Yep. Insurance agent. <laughs> so, mm. so, uh, and, and and so you came up, and uh, and and Ms. Loya stayed in in Chihuahua. Yeah. So, how long did that last? Two the, years. Two years. Till till the, I guess the fall. Oh, I guess the winter of 1976. So it was all 1975, and until November of 1976, when we were finally able to sell those cattle that we had on the ranch. And what 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 became of the ranch? Uh, the ranch we sold it uh, about ten years ago. Okay. Uh, we sold it about 10 years ago. It was just untenable to have any yeah. longer. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So, <clears throat> um, learning insurance, what was that like? You know, that, that when, when my friend took me to, uh, for the interview with the district manager of Farmers, uh, he mentioned that there was an agency in a place called Northeast El Paso uh, that belonged to two agents who had just abandoned the farms right. and abandoned their customers and right. taken off on him. And, and he offered that, that book of business to my friend. But my friend said, no, my wife doesn't want to live in Northeast. She wants to live on the east side. And, and so, th you know, thank you, but no thank you. And I remember that. And th this was early summer or late spring of 1974. And then he, you know, this is when we agreed to go back, take, talk it over with the family, take the tests, you know, study for the test, come back, take the test, get the licenses. And, and this is why all of that, finally came to fruition with my licensing in December, on December 17th, 1974, and that's the date I used to date the agency as its founding date, Wow. December 17th. But really, I didn't start selling until the first working day of 75, 1975. But I remembered that business about the agency, and I asked him, he said, I don't you know, you, t you were telling my friend if uh, he wanted these abandoned files. He said, if, if they're still available, I'd like them. He said, well, okay. He said, I'll talk to the guys that are up there in that office, and if they take you as a partner or they take you as another agent in that office to share with them, you can have them. And so then I had to get a map and find out where Northeast East El Paso was, and I did, and then we, I went up there and I met the guys, and we seemed to be, you know, that we, got, we hit it off well, and it looked like we were gonna get along. They said, fine, come join us in the office and start working those files. It was something to do, and it was, better than, than starting from scratch because I didn't have any family or neighbors or anybody I knew to sell to here. So at least I had these customers who had been abandoned by their previous agents and, and Northeast customers were fiercely loyal to me. Uh, once I, I, I brought them on board with me okay. and I am eternally grateful to them and to Northeast really? for having provided me with a, with a solid start in, wow. in my profession. God, that's fantastic. And, and so, uh, and while you're building the practice, Mrs. Loya is still in Chihuahua? She's still in Chihuahua, okay. And this, in, in the summer of 75, my, I told her to send the kids up here because, you know, I take care of them. And I, so I, once they got out of, finished the school year, uh, they came up here and they didn't speak a word of English because I had never intended to live in the United States again. But we, across, about a block from the office that I started at, there on Northeast on Rushing and Dyer, uh, there on Will Ruth and Dyer, which is the same street Rushing, he just changed his name when it crosses Dyer. Um, there was a, a school that, that provided a dual language classes in the summer, 
uh, I think Schuster School, mm -hmm. and, and they gave you lunch. Yeah. <laughs> they gave the kids lunch, and then so I put them in there. I said, "You're going to learn English here. You got three wow. months to learn English." Wow. And then uh, after you know you eat lunch here, you just go next door to the YMCA and you stay there till I come get you in the wow. evening. How old were they at the time? They were ten and, uh, and eleven. Okay, so they became. And, and, and they did. They. they, they uh, when September started, they, they went to school at, uh, at uh, what is it? Uh, it was a middle school up there in Northeast, uh, Terrace Hills. Okay, okay. <coughs> and uh, you had an apartment, a house at the time? Well, at first I rented an apartment, and uh, I stayed in there from until around the time that they came up here in the summer, uh, and uh, then we, we, we rented a house up there further up uh, on in the northeast up on Galahad and what was then War Road, I think, Martin oh, wow, Luther King Boulevard there, now. There. Wow. <clears throat> and so um, as, as, you're, as you're running the insurance in, industry and, 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 and building a practice, um, your kids are, are at the Y. Uh, one of the things is you're very involved with the Y now, mm -hmm. the, the YMCA. Uh, is that a lar large part due to the fact that you were close to them, then they were important to you? As that's certainly a factor, yes. And that's a factor that, that at that time I was just a member and they were members. And, but also in Santa Ana, you know, I had, I had grown up in a YMCA. Oh, okay. I had learned to swim in a YMCA. So I, I had roots that went way back to my childhood. And, okay. and, and so this is why it's an organization to which we have always been very grateful. <clears throat> yeah, and, and after a while I want to talk about that because you, you've, you've, you've Become, you were an ambassador for the Y. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, so as you're building your practice now, uh, and, 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 and soon you bring your, your wife up, and, and, and uh, what was it like to build a practice? Well, first of all, you know, when, when you mentioned the kids, uh, my son and daughter, um, you know, I have to say that they took care of themselves. Uh, and uh, without that, a lot of other things would not have been possible. Wow. Uh, and then when Mrs. Lawyer came, uh, you know, they had already been up here a year and a half. And uh, they never gave me any problems. Wow. So they were. So that, yeah, they went to school, they cleaned the house, they made their food. And I mean, they were like little adults. Wow. As, as, young, so as young teens. I, I thought it was, yeah. And uh, that was, of course, you know, when you look back, that's part of the reason, a pillar of the success that the family now shares. Um, and, and, then, and so it gave me time to stay at the office all the time I needed to, uh, to, to succeed, to eventually find the success that, that we did find. Uh, that is, I, you know, I could work from early morning till very late at night without the problem of worrying about the kids. Were they okay, were they not okay? I knew they were okay, and they were. But it was difficult, yes. Well, today insurance isn't easy, and uh, people have their ups and downs. Uh, did you have ups and downs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, the bigger you get, the bigger the downs. Uh, at that time, we weren't too big, so the downs weren't, weren't as bad as they would get later on when after people viewed us as quote unquote successful. Uh, I mean, I know we can get into that later, you know, when, when we go and develop the story of, of the business. But at that time, yeah, sure, you know, you, you, you now encounter a lot of rejection when you're out there. You have to learn to deal that and overcome it and not let it bother you and go just from one rejection to the next customer. And, he rejects you. Get go to the next one until somebody says yes, and then okay. you know until you until there's more. You, you know when at first there's a lot of no's. Oh man, oh, there was a lot of no's for every one yes, and then sooner or later start turning. So when Mrs. Loya comes up, does she help you with the business too again? Uh, yes, yeah. She uh, she she didn't speak English uh, very well then. I mean, because there had been no need down there, and but yeah, she helped me on the phones. Yeah. She was just. You know, call all the everybody with Hispanic names. She'd yeah. call them and, <laughs> That's good. and tell them how lucky yeah. they'd be if they got insurance That's from right. us. <laughs> so, did you like the business? Yes. And so, uh, uh, and the kids kind of grew up in the business, I guess. Yes. So it's a family business now. Yes. And is, is are you the sole agent now in the, in your office? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, the company developed over the years from different stages in insurance. 
I mean, we went from a, you know, a, a, a local agency that they call a local recording agency. And then we became, after I left Farmers in 1985, and I became what, an independent agent, okay. selling for different companies, representing more than one company. And after that, in 1996, we were in 19, late 1995, but really started selling in 1996, there's something called a managing general agency. The difference between that and a regular agency is that you keep the premium and you pay the losses and you remit the difference to, to somebody else, you know, to the reinsurers that we call them. As opposed to as an agent, you send all the premium to the company, to a, an insurance company, and then they send you your commission at the end of the month. But as a managing general agency, you retain all the premium and you pay the losses. Wow, so when did you, that's a bold move. Yes, it was. Yeah. And why did you make that move? Well, I, 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 was, uh, I mean, uh, well, this, this was just progression that we saw that, you know, okay. the, to put to use the experience that we were gathering in the lower stages and, and saying, well, let's just take on something a little bit bigger now because if we succeed, we'll be better off. You know, now is when these downs become more, uh, more precarious and, and, and you look down over the side and that, that cliff is more precarious, is more precipitous. Uh, it's a steep one. Uh, for 10 years, I was a managing general agent, what they call an MGA. This is, again, where we paint the losses and we got a lot of experience. And it was then that, you know, right away we, we ran into a massive problem in that uh, we didn't have the right people. Uh, and even though there were just a few of us and we were still essentially a local company, we hadn't, it was during that period of time when we started opening offices along the border of Texas, Mexico, down to McAllen. But around uh, October of 1996 to June of 98, we hit a time that I referred to as the time of the troubles, based on Northern Ireland's troubles times with England, with, with Britain. The time of the troubles, they were really bad. Man. That was really wow. bad wow. during those times. I mean, they did test our souls. Wow. <clears throat> well, we're going we're gonna to have to really get into that story because, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, certainly have a nice company now, but there were some struggles there. Yes, there were. And uh, and uh, how your family helped you through that is something that we want to we want to get into. Um, and uh, you know, I find the story fascinating, of course. Uh, but you know, with such a such a well-known name here, uh, you know, the story uh, is is not known. So it's it's a pleasure to to have this opportunity to share your story. In our first segment, we were talking about. Um, you're, you're coming uh, to El Paso, uh, being born in California, working with your, your father's cattle ranch in Chihuahua, and then moving to El Paso because cattle prices went down, and, and you started insurance with farmers. Now, so you, you started, you take over this agency in Northeast El Paso uh, because the previous people had dropped their, their clients and you, you were able to pick up that book. So you were with farmers for, for how many years? Ten years. Ten From years 1975, with 1975, 1985. Learning the insurance in, industry. Yes, I view that as a, an important apprenticeship that was the foundation of everything that came after. And then you become independent? An independent agent for the next ten years. Now, at this time, did your business name stay the same? Fred Law no, Insurance? It was Fred Law Insurance, yes. All the time. So when you become independent, what did that involve? Well, that just involved uh, representing more than one company. Of course, it represented, uh, uh, you know, giving up all the farmers' customers. Uh, I mean, because farmers okay. came after them, they put other agents to compete there. So it, it involved starting over again. Wow. And so um, that, that transition was that, uh, why did you do that? Why did you break away and go on your own? There was, um, I was doing well as a, as a farmer's agent, but I just thought I could do better as an independent agent, better for myself and my family, and better for the community. Uh, we started having to, because of the strict requirements to insure autos back in those years, as opposed to now, where you see all the commercials soliciting nothing but auto. It wasn't that way back then. Uh, I mean, the companies almost made it a favor to insure your car. and. They wanted your house first, or they wanted you to buy life insurance. It was it was a different market and a different environment, and I started turning away a lot of people who had looked to me to solve their auto insurance needs. And I, since I could no longer do it with farmers, I felt it was time to leave, 
and find avenues that, of, of, of products that I could solve their problem because that's what they expected of me to do. And they were coming now, they had, people had started coming to me from all over El Paso, from as far as away as the Lower Valley and you know, Fabens, Clint, they were coming all the way up to the Northeast. And I would ask them, my goodness, what are you doing up here so far? Uh, for you, he said, oh, we look at it as a day out in the country. They <laughs> go with a family, a family outing. So he you says, saw a need that was underserved? Yeah. Is that yes. what it was? Underserved market. And uh, and so as this business grew, did it did it grew, right? Yes. And uh, did you have challenges and difficulties in growing your independent agency? Yes, we we had we had problem because again it was convincing customers to leave a well-known company for a fairly new entity, which was Fred Lawyer Insurance. And, uh, and, and so there was a lot of convincing to keep some of my customers from the previous company and then uh, to convince others that, that I would take care of them. So it required instilling trust and I was able to do that. But it was, it was a work, it was a labor of, of convincing all over again. But it, because it was a labor of love for me, I was able to convince them and, and they did uh, come with me and stay with me and buy from me as opposed to buying from the previous company or buying from anybody else. And um, eventually, you know, they, the trust factor just became automatic. Did you have the resources to grow the business? Um, as an independent agent, yes. There, there, there wasn't too much required. There was, I mean, you either sold and, and you had resources or you didn't sell and didn't have resources. So as you grew now, because this grew, this business began to grow. Yes. You, what was the next step for your growth? Okay, well in 1985, as soon as I left Farmer, I started opening other offices. I opened a second office on the east side, uh, on Lee Trevino and, uh, and uh, up Montwood. It was uh, a couple of blocks from where I am now, where my home office is. The company's home office is, is Lee Trevino and Traywood. And, uh, and then we started, and then we opened another one in the Lower Valley, uh, the second one in the Lower Valley, and, and, and different offices in different places of El Paso. You would hire agents to run those offices? Uh, we would hire, they were all employees. I mean, there they, they was no independent agents. It's always been an organic growth to date wow. uh, on, on our part. We, we so made that's that the model. Decision. That, that's yes, the model so we made know. that decision a long time ago that we would not grow through independent agents. We would grow through our own in-house uh, associates. So they get their license and, 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 and their license with the state and they, they work for you? Yes. And uh, so you found that model successful? You had success with that model then? Yes, uh, and uh, that, that worked well for 10 years. And then there was an opportunity to become what I think I refer to as a MGA, ma uh, Managing General Agency. The difference there between it and the other uh, the regular agents, the normal recording agents, uh, is that we retain all the money that the customer pays and we pay the losses and remit the difference to the insurance company. Now you're dealing with a lot of money. Now we're starting to deal with more money and more responsibilities and more risk because we are responsible for the losses and the insurance company still looks to us for a profit. Wow. So where did you go for support? Did you have support? Uh, you know, the local banks did provide some support. I mean, they, they were there for us. Uh, we, we couldn't really get true capitalization here in town because it was a difficult business to understand. And uh, essentially the type of in backing that's required of us to show the Department of Insurance in, 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 in here in Texas, at that time it was the only one where we operated, but the regulatory bodies of insurance in all the states require you to have what they call unencumbered capital. That means if you have money, they want to see the money without any liens attached to it. Now, whatever money the bank loans you just becomes essentially a signature loan because that money belongs to the state after it's put into your reserves. And you say, this is the money that I have to back me up and pay claims with, then you know nobody can claim it except uh, your shareholders. Uh, I mean, except the policy holders and, and, and the departments of insurance that are regulating you. So this was difficult for them to understand and I can see that now, but nevertheless, they did provide help. Uh, up to a certain level. And then the true capitalization came later on from, from another bank, an out-of-town bank, a Texas bank, but, but nevertheless an out-of-town bank. So you had to go out of town to get the resources yes. you needed. <clears throat> but once you had that, that capitalization, you could grow. Uh, how many uh, offices did you open? 
Well, right away we encountered disaster. I mean, mm -hmm. then, you know, I saw the wisdom of the local banks in not wanting to loan money for somebody in this type of business because mm -hmm. we almost went broke right away really? as a managing general agency uh, in 1996. And I, I think I, I mentioned in the first segment that we entered a period of time called the time of the troubles, really? and which happened from, uh, took place between October of 1996 and June of 1998 when we emerged from this dark period in our history. Wow. But these were times that, that really tried our souls. So you're saying these times really try men's souls? Oh, absolutely. There's a story told about this Don Cacahuate. He's a character in some Mexican jokes. So, and anyway, there's this guy, he's a, you know, just a, a, a goofy guy that comes up with all these harebrained schemes at all times. And, and the story is that somebody met him and he asked, hey, Mr. You know, Don Cacahuate translates into Mr. Peanut. How's it going? What are you doing? He said, oh, he said, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm developing a new breed of horse. He said, really? He said, well, what kind of breed is that? The man asked him. He said, well, it's a breed that a horse that doesn't need to eat to live. He said, wow, that's tremendous. Well, good luck. So they part ways and they meet some months later. And the guy asks Mr. Peanut, he said, well, how'd it go, Mr. Peanut, with a breed of horse that you were developing? Almost had it. He says, I was just on the edge of having, of doing it, of succeeding. He says, well, what happened? Oh, he says, the horse starved to death. <laughs> you know? Well, at, at, front, at our household, the family of four, he said, we may not have learned to eat, to live without eating, but we did learn to live without sleeping. And I can assure you that from October of 1996 to June of 1998, I mean, the lights burned 24-7 at our house. One of us was awake at all times, you know, working on opening the company the next day. So what was that about? That was about the fact that, that we had lost money, uh, you know, because it was a new experience and we got careless, let's say. We lost money for the insurance companies and they just cut us off. I mean, there was nothing forthcoming to pay losses with. And they made it clear that, you know, that what they were financing and what they were reinsuring was something else. and that. Well, you know, we just got into the problems of that we didn't make them the money that they thought. So now, I mean, they took what I view now, and I view then as draconian measures against us. I mean, certainly punitive at best. And, uh, and uh, I mean, there were times of very deep struggle and profound struggle for us. So how did you, how did you How do we emerge? Yeah, how did well, you we kept selling it? policies. We kept selling insurance. We kept opening the offices every day, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we, we, we just didn't lose sight of what it was that we were going to do. So what, it, what was it like having to stay up 24 hours to keep the office open? What was that like? Was that making phone calls? Was that doing the books? Well, essentially, it was making sure that we had all the accounts of, the, of that day's activities recorded and, and that we knew how much money we were going to uh, have in the bank when, we, when it opened okay. the next day and uh, making sure who do we have on the payroll, can we still pay them tomorrow, you know? He said, we don't want anybody uh, that we can't pay at the end of the week. They said, we, you know, we gotta tell them what time. But no, we met payrolls. Uh, we didn't give any raises during those times. So you really got into cash management. Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. I had the pennies management, that's and, all we had. How long <laughs> did this last two years? From, June, from uh, um, October 96 to June of 1998. Your son, your daughter, and your wife were all helping. Yes. And one of us was always away. My, my, uh, my wife would make uh, you know, dinner. He, she'd make sandwiches for my son who was on the bed just going over the numbers, determining you know, where can we write the business to make more money for us and better give a customer a better deal so he brings his friends and this type of thing. And how old were your children then? Uh, they were, by now they had, uh, 19, yeah, they had graduated from high school. They were, they were already in the business. So they know the numbers of the business. Yeah, they knew the numbers by now. And they went through the struggle. Yes. So how did you emerge from this struggle? Well, after a while, you know, we, we, uh, we learned what it was to be an MGA as opposed to being a regular agent. And then we started making money for the reinsurers and the insurance companies that had provided us with, with the ability to write the business in the first place. And once they started making the money that they wanted, then they started, you know, increasing our commission and participation in the profits of the companies. Was there a miscalculation when you uh, made that jump to go as a... Well, there was just other errors. I mean, there, there's, that, that's getting into the minutia of the business. Essentially what happened was that because we had never had experience in paying claims, the same people who gave us this opportunity brought what we call a TPA, a third party administrator to pay claims. 
a, a, an entity, a business that dedicates itself to paying claims, insurance claims, and, and they, they really didn't know what they were doing, but I didn't find out uh, uh, for several months, and by that time I was deep in the hole. Oh, gee. <clears throat> so you just kept plugging on and plugging on yes, and plugging yeah, we, on? Yes, like I say, they, they tried that. Those were times that tried our souls. I mean, but we went to the office every day. We sustained each other because a couple of times I would tell them, I said, what do we just declare bankruptcy and just start over as agents? No, we're not. He said, we're going to come out of this. So what was the message that you had to yourself at that time? Uh, you know, I said, well, no, if, you know, if the family isn't chickening out. I'm certainly not going to chicken out. I said, we're going to stay together on this. They want to stay together on this. They want to, you know, they view this as a road to eventual triumph to eventual, to reaching a level of success that we can't reach in the previous model. Did you have a dream at this time about your agency? Well, it was a tenuous one at that time. I mean, I mean, it got kind of, you know, unfocused and kind of got foggy there from what I had before going into the time of the troubles, which was to, uh, uh, my dream at that time was we had to have an insurance on every block in the city. And then when we started going to other cities, I said, well, let's have an insurance on every block in every city in which we have offices. That, that, that was the goal. I said, if we do that, we'll be okay. Wow, that's a big goal. <clears throat> and so through this time of trouble and losing focus and all, um, where did that drive come from? Oh, we never lost focus. No, that, that we never lost. We, okay. we, uh, we, uh, the dream just seemed to fade. Okay, know? okay. And okay. It, became, uh, it seemed to become more unattainable, but we never lost focus. Where did the drive come from? I, 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 you know, I think uh, uh, in my case it came from whatever upbringing I, I brought to the table uh, uh, to begin with. And this is, I attribute, of course, to my parents who instilled in me uh, the work ethic that I mentioned uh, earlier to you in this program. Uh, and the uh, values that they instilled in me from way back then. And certainly I like to think that my children had values that my wife and I instilled in them. So it's, it's, it, it goes back to when you were awakened at 4 in the morning or whatever to, to count tortillas. Count to 12, yeah. Wow, <laughs> fantastic. So you come out of this now. What, what, what was the breakthrough uh, from at, the, at that time of getting out of that time of troubles? Well, the breakthrough was... Uh, was a check for, for a, a contingency bonus, as they call it, for having reached a certain level of profitability for the insurance companies that have provided us with, a, with the, uh, the capital to, to sell insurance. And, and that was a, well, it was a million dollars. That's what they gave me. And, wow. uh, and you know, that, you know, when, when they gave it to me, I, the first thing is I went to see Mr. Young at, at one of the local banks here. He was our banker, and I said, there it is. He said, I did it. He said, we did it. They had deposited it. And he looked at the check, and he went and he deposited it right away in the account. Randolph Young. Uh, yeah, Randolph Young, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, who had been the banker with me since, since 1975. And I said, there, we're out of the hole now. I said, you, you sure are, Fred. You sure are. You did it. Wow. Thank and that, you. that's what did it. And uh, so things got better after that. And uh, they kept telling us that we should participate by becoming a reinsurer ourselves. And that's when obstacles came into play and now we were okay we, we, we were not a big player but certainly we were more than just a local agent and and they said okay well you know they didn't think that we would come up with the money they said well how much do we need well you need two and a half million dollars well I have five million and and I and then I said well you know we have two and a half let's see if the bank will loan us two and a half and they did and that was a local bank uh, loaned us the two and a half million dollars and uh, uh, we, um, that's Chase Bank. I mean, I'm proud yeah. to say that, that they how many, stepped how many, up. And, and how many offices did you have at that time? Oh, at that time I would have had maybe 50, 60 wow. around, in, in, along the border. From, in Texas? From El Paso to, to McAllen. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Now, and uh, when we came up, so we told our reinsurers, and the, the, which essentially in another business would be called like your financial backers, I guess. You know, it... Uh, we told him, well, there's the five million dollars. Oh no, I said, well, you, you, you can't really, we can't take your money. He said, well, why not? He says, you're not, uh, you're not rated. They said, well, what does that mean? We have to get rated. He said, well, you, how do you get rated? Well, you need experience. He said, well, how do you get experience? Well, you need to be rated. So, so now we're in a catch-22, going around and around with them. 
What was their motivation for giving you that hard time? Well, I don't think they ever thought we'd come up with a five million. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's the only thing we can think of now, but I mean, it was one hurdle after another. Uh, I, I mean, now we see different types of hurdles. Now that we've overcome the financial one, uh, now, now there was other hurdles about experience, about uh, rating in the standard and poor companies and, and what have you. I mean, Do you think any of that was because you're Fred Loya? Uh, I don't like to think so, so. Okay. We just let it go with that, but, yeah. uh, but I mean, we've seen others that, that didn't run into the same problems, and I've seen others that were rising at the same time as we were and failed totally and don't exist any longer, uh -huh. and they didn't run into these problems. Maybe it's those problems that made us, and since they didn't encounter them, they failed eventually. When they did uh -huh. run into one, all of a sudden, out of nowhere. So you'd run into a challenge, and yeah, you we just... we were running into one hurdle after another. And you just uh, overcame we were, it? We just overcame them. We just sort of... You just found a way to do that? How'd you do that? Your, your family uh, was your team of advisors? Yeah, we, yeah and, and, uh, and I mean, uh, if I didn't take the lead, somebody else would. You know, Mrs. Lawyer would take the lead, or my son would take the lead, and then my daughter would. And, uh, and so we, we would just stand together on all this. Uh, and eventually we did. And then they said, well, okay, we're going to take your money, but we're not going to pay your commissions up front. <laughs> and, okay, what are you going to pay me? It's going to take you two and a half years, but then we'll start paying you. Okay, so we still went along, and then they, they you know, we, we cut that two and a half years down to a year and a half, and then a year, and they started paying us. And wow. then now we started rolling this thing over, but still we were paying somebody else to use their name on the policies. Uh, we were paying a lot of uh, the reinsurance fees. This is the fees for providing the money for the capital to write the policies to begin with that's required by the state. He said, well, how can we start doing away with that? Well, we started taking a little bit more, a little bit more. Finally, an out-of-town bank came to the table and says, you know, what do you need? And we told them what we needed, and it was a significant amount of cash for us at the time. And they said, okay, we'll do it. And that's when I really found out exactly what a signature loan was. Because I know the four of us, uh, me, my wife, my son, and my dad, we signed papers for, f for three hours, for three hours. Really? Uh -huh. There was a lawyer's office here, here in town in, at, the, at one of the bank buildings. And then for three hours, we just signed and signed and signed. I said, now I know what they mean by us, because that's all it was. In the end, there was nothing there that I will guarantee. Because again, like I told you earlier in the earlier segment, the, you know, the Department of Insurance claims the money. It takes it without encumbrances and says, this is my money, to pay your losses in case for the business that we allow you to write. Oh, gee. The, and you don't have access to it. It just has to be there. Oh, it has to be there. Right. <laughs> and so you had to pay on your... <laughs> and the bank doesn't have access to it either. So, so at this point, now th there's a period there where you're, you, you're, you're kind of at a, at a cap of a certain amount of, of, uh, of uh, size, I guess I'd say. And then, and then uh, uh, to get to the next level, that's what you're doing now, right? You're, you're getting to the next level in, to, to, to oh, this grow. Is, no, this, well, you've got to go back to 2000 for that. Uh, 2001. At that time, on the type of company that we were, you know, the book had been closed as far as Texas licensing new companies. They had closed the book and then they were not going to license or issue certificates of authority to anybody like us ever again. So we needed a law passed, you know, for this. And so uh, a bill went through the House and the Senate, which was forgot the name of them. There was, you know, how they're all numbered, SB this or yeah. HB this. And uh, anyway, this was the Fred Lawyer bill, but we got it through. Is that where Paul Moreno helped you? Yes, Paul Moreno was instrumental in the passage of that bill. The Fred Lawyer bill. Uh, that's how it was known. Just, yeah. you know, and that allowed you then to... Then the state chartered me as, a, uh, as an insurance company. So it took the legislature to charter you as, a, as, a, as an insurance uh, company. Was, yeah, well, it was the governor who signed the bill into effect, but yes, that's what it took. So now I have my own insurance company. We have our own insurance company. And we have enough money for our own reinsurance company. Now we don't pay anybody else. So how long did this take you from? from this took from 2002. And you started in? 1974. So that's a, that's, 20, a, that's yeah. a good haul. That was a long, long time in coming. So, so now you can start to grow. So when, when the bill was passed, how big were you as a company? You know, I, I really don't remember. That, that's, that's a good question. I wasn't prepared for it, and I apologize. About 20 million, I would say. Okay, okay. And uh, so after that, now you could grow. And we started growing. Really, we started growing exponentially. 
And did you grow? And, and of course, you're going to other states. Uh, we went to other states. Was it easier to get into the states now? Uh, well, it was possible. It wasn't possible before. Okay. Uh, we we went into California as an agency, and then you know that that, that had a lot of. I mean, just the profit margins were a lot smaller. We couldn't set rates because we had to rely on the insurance company for whom we wrote to determine the rate we would charge our customers. Now, through all this time, as you're as you're growing, you're also very involved. You're volunteering. You're very involved with the with with the YMCA. Well, it started in 1998, 1999, after emerging from the time of the trouble. I decided, you know, I said, you know, this requires a lot more energy, I think, than I'm. Than I have, and, and my son took the lead, and I gave him the company to run. So he became the CEO in charge of operations, which is selling and paying claims. And my daughter, I named president, and she's in charge of administration of everything that isn't involved, which is, you know, the, the accounting processes, the advertising, the things that don't involve selling and paying claims. And she's in charge of that. And. Uh, and then we had this young man, I told you, from uh, that was now living in McAllen, who, who had started with us here as a junior in, in high school when he was at his letter. Uh, a young man by the name of Ben Salazar. He's the chief operating officer. And then later on, we, oh, I think about, later on, a few years later, we uh, uh, hired, and we were fortunate to hire the, a CFO, a chief financial officer by the name of uh, Joe Ramirez, who's still with us, and he's outstanding. Yeah, fantastic. So these are the uh, these are the officers of the company who have proven to be the backbone and, and provided it with the leadership necessary for the growth that has come since. And and uh, and you have facilities in in McAllen and in San Antonio. You have yes, yes. Yeah. We've been very successful in, in the Rio Grande Valley in McAllen, Harlingen, and those, those cities down there. And I think that they view us as being from there. Okay. They wow. view us as being. Their, their agents. <laughs> so, um, so growing from a from a local business to a to a to a large business, three thousand employees now, right? Three thousand employees. Um, what what message can we can we uh, can we gather from all of that experience you went through? What uh, what message do you have? And I think most most people in, in, in my position are one similar, and, and, and I'm not bragging about anything that that we've done. I mean, because we we as a family and feel that there's still a long ways to go, and there's a long ways that we should go, and that is our and and, and so there's a long ways to go that we are obligated to go. I um, mean, we've made a promise to a lot of people, all of our employees, that we will look after their welfare into succeeding generations, and we intend to keep that promise. Um, the lesson is, is, I mean, some of these things, you know, this are simple. You know, you just open the office every day, uh, and then you say, oh, well, I can do that. No, oh, you know, but then weddings come up, quinceañeras come up, all kinds of, you, know, you get sick, all kinds of reasons, and all of a sudden you're not opening the office every day for whatever reason. And that's one thing that you have to do. Uh, you know, some of the other things that you that are turning into cliches, treat the customer with respect, be honest. Uh, I say be enthusiastic, <laughs> you know. Uh, these are the things that I, I would pass on to those who, who come after me, That, but, but never lose sight of whatever goal you've set for yourself. What got us here was single-mindedness of purpose on what we wanted to accomplish. And that started by opening the office every day at the same time. Wow. And you've also contributed to this community in many ways. You were an ambassador for the YMCA, traveled the world for them, right? Yes. And uh, and you also have a, a, your benefactor to the to a branch, right, of, of the Y. Yes, they. they uh, I was. Uh, my family and I were honored by the YMCA naming a, one of the, their facilities a branch after us, uh, Fred and Maria Loya YMCA over there on Treywood and Loma Land. <coughs> well, your story is we, certainly a. Um, a fascinating story, and uh, it's uh, it's one that um, we need to hear over and over again because uh, you know that that idea of of opening the office every day is a very very powerful very powerful message, and uh, and you certainly exemplify uh, persistence and dedication and 
and I like the way you emphasize focus, uh, you and, and Mrs. Loya and, and your family. I, I really, really appreciate your time in sharing your story. We're very fortunate today to, to have with us uh, uh, Mr. Fred Loya uh, from Fred Loya Insurance. Uh, this is our, our third, third segment uh, of interview with Mr. Loya. He's very kind to, to give us his, his time. Mr. Loya, I appreciate your time very much. Oh, on the contrary, thank you, Amanda, for having me on, on your show. I think it's an outstanding forum that will serve many generations of El Pasoans to come, and I hope that my story, in some small way, helps to inspire them. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate your allowing us to tell your story, because I think, I think it is an inspiring story. You know, you grew up in a tortilla factory, in a sense, counting tortillas, and went to Long Beach State, and uh, had a cattle ranch, and you were a, you were a cattleman. For, for a period, and you served the service in, in the country, you served in the Army, yes, and you sir. come to, uh, back to El Paso and build a, a successful insurance agency. <clears throat> but it's not been without a lot of, a lot of, lot of struggle. So, um, a couple of things I'd like to, I'd like to discuss with you is, is some of the difficulties that, that people have in building a business, um, and, and how you, 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 you've been able to overcome challenges because you kept you just kept facing the challenge and finding a way around that. Um, how how did you um, you know in building in building the business now now a big business um, you still have challenges right? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, I mean the bigger the business, the bigger the challenges. And uh, I mean, for instance, when we first discussed with some of our uh, business associates. Uh, for instance, one of the company who we rented the name from. I mean, there was another company who said, we didn't have a Fred Lawyer insurance company. We had to use somebody else's name to write insurance, and they charged us for that. We didn't have enough finance to, uh, to, um, to back the policies that we wrote with sufficient reserve capital, that it's called, uh, required by the, each state, each uh, department of insurance in every state. Uh, that you operate in, uh, you, you have to get reinsurance someplace. That's what it's called. It's, this financial backing is called reinsurance. So if you don't have it, you got to get it someplace else. And, 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 and in getting all of these things and achieving all of these landmarks and, and milestones that you have to pass as you grow, yeah, there, there's, there, the challenges become bigger and bigger. And you roll with a company now uh, as, as, a, as an advisor. You're chairman of the board. Uh, how, how important is that role? I view it as important. I don't know how my son, who's the CEO, and my daughter, who's president, view it. I mean, they sometimes they view it as as cumbersome and on them. Uh, but but I, I still view it. I'm proud of my role in the company. I'm proud to have now been able to pass the day-to-day -day operations on to my son and my daughter. But you have developed generation. you have developed a corporate culture. Yes, yeah, we do have a corporate. A cor uh, a corporate culture of discipline uh, that's encompassed in, uh, in certain core values that we have published in, in every cubicle for every employee that works there to see every day. So are you the, um, the keeper of the cultural values? Oh, I think, I think that the generation that now runs the company is, is the keeper of those values. They, they are very committed to, to whatever um, values I instilled as being the fundamentals by which to run a business. Uh, they're, as, they're as committed or more committed than I am. I'm very proud of my son and daughter. Can you share some of those values? Um, yes, for instance, we're, you know, we, we have uh, uh, one, one management, uh, a chain of command that's inviolate. Uh, we have, uh, mm, uh, th those are the main ones. Those are the main ones. Uh, you know, that, that you can't broach your chain of command. You, you have to adhere to it. Uh, we're married to our goals. Uh, that, that is that, you know, there's no deviation from what we set out to do uh, and, and that we will accomplish them in the time given us to do so. <coughs> Mr. Leia, you growing up in Los Angeles, having spent time in Chihuahua and uh, coming back to the United States, <coughs> um, um, what 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 is that experience like as is, is Hispanic? Uh, is is that a significantly different experience than others would have? 
Uh, perhaps so. Uh, I mean, if uh, I imagine that here we're talking now about, say, bigotry, racism, and this type of thing. We, we've never used uh, racism as, as a flag or, or, or as a banner to hide behind or to wave in other people's faces as, or, or, or to use as, as an excuse for failing to achieve our goals, uh, even though it's there. For instance, uh, one of the young men who's, who's, the, who's the highest ranking officer in the company is Ben Salazar. He's a young uh, Hispanic here from El Paso who now lives in McAllen, but he's the chief operating officer of the company. He is very, very light-skinned. So if you see him, he looks very white because he's almost red. And I remember that once my son and Ben took over the operational responsibilities of the company, he came back from a meeting with some of these people that we had to deal with at the time and as we were struggling to form our own insurance company. And he said for the first time, he said, you know, I, I felt the whip of racism. Mm. Ben did. Wow. And this was, excuse me, after we were successful. That stings, huh? But you've been able to to go around that. Yes, I apologize for breaking down, but mm. yeah, we don't uh, we don't like to use it, and like I said, we never have. You will never find any of us recurring to a claim of racism in excusing any of our failures. Success doesn't have excuses; it has it has uh, reasons, and. Uh, uh, you know, certainly we've shared some of that, but is, what, what, is, what are the reasons for your success, Mr. Loya? Well, I read once, well, you know, you, you have a lot of cute sayings and little aphorisms that sometimes you, you try and explain away because I, I think it, it's difficult to really come to grasp is what, what made me and what didn't, and why did he, break, he go broke? You know, you, you see corner, let's just talk about the pop, mom and pop, corner grocery stores, why, why does one succeed and one fail? Or why do you see uh, uh, the same store on the, on the same corner fail and fail and fail under different ownership until all of a sudden it succeeds when nothing else changes other than the person's inside, you know, ringing up the sales. I mean, what, what is it? It says, you know, I think success, one of my favorite aphorisms, if you will, is success comes from good, uh, uh, what is it, comes from experience, uh, from good decisions. And, and, and good decisions often come from a lot of experience, and experience comes from a lot of bad decisions. You know, from making bad decisions, it just progresses. And you've made your but, share of bad decisions. Yes, and, and, but the thing is, I think it's the perseverance, the, the focus on the goal, the, the never losing track of where you're going, and, and, and the continuing to butt your head against that dam, if you will, that, uh, that eventually goes to success. I mean, you know, you... You do the same thing over and uh, again, try, you know, until, until, until it works for you. <clears throat> well, the other thing now is where do you take that success? Of course, you're growing your company, your, your, your son and daughter are growing the company. Uh, you still have a role with the company. Uh, but some of the things that you've done uh, in, in, in El Paso are very important. Um, and and uh, you know, I want to talk a, a about that, and I'll use the term philanthropy, if you don't mind. Uh, that That's a role that now the Hispanic community can begin to experience. Yes. It's not a role that we used to experience very much at all. In fact, you're, you're uh, very much involved at, at the beginning of that kind of a experience and something we want to see more of uh, as, as our community grows. Um, what does that mean to you and how do you look at it? Well, first of all, I want to say that I certainly don't view myself as a philanthropist in, uh, in, at the level or, or in the order of others that we have in the city that are outstanding standing uh, human beings and contributors to the success of their fellow men here uh, that we've seen lately that give you know tens of millions of dollars to different causes and, and whom I hold in the highest regard and hope that one day I, I can certainly emulate and reach those levels of philanthropy. But I, I believe, Omero, that uh, I guess that old saying that says, uh, by working, you make a living. By giving, you make a life. I like that. Okay, so that I believe in, and to the degree that I can, you know, since uh, make a life, I will by giving. 
So what is the thrill now that you get? I mean, you've built a company, you've built it right, it's growing. What is the thrill now for you? Well, it's, it's watching uh, the second generation take it to higher levels, levels that, uh, that I imagined but, but never really, you know, visualized as happening in my lifetime. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's my thrill. Every day I get up and I'd like to see where do we stand on, say, where do we stand? How big are we today or how small? Did we shrink or did we grow yesterday? Where are we? That, that, that's it. To see that company grow, to see it meet its, com its stated commitment to provide for the well-being of all of our employees and those to come. So how big do you want to get? Well, like the guy says, I guess you can't be too rich or too thin. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and it's not the money, of course. It's just a, it's a matter of, 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 of just how many people can we help. As employees, as and clients. Employees and employees and customers out there. But you've had a single focus on your, on your clients as well. You've, you've started serving an underserved yes. market, and you still do. Yes. And you're growing that? Yes. And yeah, we, we saw that. I mean, you know, a lot of the people that have stayed insured with us for now 10, 15, 20 years, have done so because no, nobody wanted to insure them at one time. I mean, as, as things change, well, yeah, then, then the market's become more competitive, and now there's been an outreach by, by other companies uh, into, in, into areas that historically they, they, they avoided like the plague. So you decided to focus on this underserved market. Can you describe that underserved market? Well, it's uh, lower income, mostly blue collar. Uh, it has other obligations to meet before it pays its insurance. So you have a lot of cancellations from with writing these type of customers. And before, you, you, the, the insurance companies would clamor uh, and proclaim loudly that they couldn't make money with processing cancellations. And, you know, we always felt that it didn't matter to us. We knew how to handle that the cancellation and then the reinstatement of coverage for the customer, and so it didn't pose a problem to us. Now you never hear that anymore from these companies because they want that customer too. But that's what he is. He's blue collar, lower income, lower middle, lower middle income. Uh, he's usually a renter as opposed to a homeowner's, and uh, he has maybe older cars. And you weren't afraid of, of no. that? And you never have been? No. You showed how to no. do it? And now we have a lot of people following us. <laughs> <clears throat> now, let me let me ask uh, to I, I know you have a, a, a home. You have something in uh, San Antonio. You have a, a farm, a, a ranch in San Antonio. Oh, uh, we have a, a small cattle ranch. I guess it was just to get back to my personal roots. Yeah. It's uh, it's really uh, southeast of, uh, of of Austin. Oh, of Austin. And, okay. and directly east of San Antonio. You're sort of out in the middle over okay. there. Okay. Okay. And uh, you spend some time there. Yes. Um, one of the other things that you do an awful lot of uh, here in El Paso, and the reason I asked you about, you know, you have another facility in San Antonio you go to. You're, you're here in El Paso a lot, especially at Christmas time. Yes. You know, Christmas time, you you have, uh, you you've you, you've done something very uh, very important in our community. At Christmas time, you have, you light up your house. You've actually made national news with here, the lighting of your house, the music. Uh, what's that experience been like? Well, it's been, uh, again, I guess like some of our beginnings, ups and that had its ups and downs. Uh, we had a lot of uh, dissension there from some of the, not, not, not immediate neighbors, but some people living in, in, in that area two years ago. And that's kind of challenged you because you say, you know, you're doing a good thing. It's costing me a lot of money. It's costing me a lot of effort and, and, and time. And, and, you know, I mean, is it really appreciated? Is it worth it? But but people told me it was, and that I should not succumb to the opposition of a relative minority of, of malcontents who really had no basis and no reasonable basis for opposing the show other than, than their own selfishness is what the way it finally was translated to me. And then I accepted that, and so we continue with the show. But it's, it's you know, it's, it's a lot of satisfaction to see all, all the smiles on everybody's face, young, old, big, small, whatever, Rich and poor to come out there and enjoy that show. Well, it's a it's a Christmas tradition now to go see the Fred Loya House. I think all so, yes, up it is. And, that's and awesome. thousands of people go, right? How yes, many thousands? thousands of uh, did you get a count this year? No, you know we haven't been able to get a good count, and so, but uh, 
close to Christmas, we'll get around 3,000 a night. Wow. Uh, and you keep it up for, for how long? It's, it's uh, the weekends in December. Okay. Uh, through, you know, from, from the first okay. weekend in December, Christmas Eve, Christmas night, until New Year's Eve night. Now, now you and Mrs. Loy have traveled the world. Yes, we have. We've. Uh, I, that, that's been under the auspices of the Y, is that? The YMCA, yes. I was uh, the chairman of the International Committee of YMCA of the USA, and in that capacity, we represented that organization in the country, and I like to think my state and my city uh, around the world. And you've gone to, you know how many countries you've gone to? Um, I think we counted them once, but it's, I think all the countries where the Y operates, but, uh, well, it's a significant number in, in all, on all the continents except maybe uh, South, uh, South, what is it, the Antarctica. Wow. So you've been all over the world uh, as a representative of the Y. Yes. National Y. Yes, sir. Wow. But I, I've also served on the board of the International YMCA. Wow. And, and you were very important to the Y here. Um, and what, what other committees and boards have you served on like that? Well, I was fortunate to serve on, on, on some city committees or a, what is it, a redistricting committee back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, I served on the airport board. Uh, I was really proud of my service on the Federal Reserve Board. I was, I was proud of that service. That was six years. So you've, so you've done some good community service. But, uh, I hope so. But El Paso is so. El Paso's still dear to you. Yes. Why is El oh, Paso absolutely. dear to you? Well, when we came, after being up here about 10 years, oh, maybe less, 1979, well, after I was up here about five years, I remember I asked my kids, who were now young teenagers, and I said, hey, where do you guys think you're from? And uh, they sort of looked at me and said, well, we're from El Paso. Where else would we be from? And I told Mrs. Loya, I said, Maria, we're from El Paso now. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Well, El Paso's very proud of, proud of you, too. And, um, <laughs> You know, you know, we learn a lot from from experience, but not all of us have have the kind of experience that, that you have. And I, I keep wanting to ask about about lessons that you can share that have come from your experience. You know, and I, I, I just tend to think that that you have a um, a message uh, that, that that you have. And I'm trying to ask, you know, what what that might be. You know, you've said several things, but but if, if you were to give a message, what would, that, what would that be? I think that once you determine what you want to be, and this doesn't come easy because, you know, I was 35 when I came here and started this business that I knew nothing about. But you have to stick with what you want to do, you know, and that's, everybody says that, but it doesn't really happen. Uh, and, and, and you don't really want to do what you say you want to do because you're really not committed to it. But once you determine and decide, this is what I want to do, if it's really what you want to do, then you have to stay with it. Uh, you, you know, again, it's going back to that opening the office business. You open it every day. You can't make excuses for not opening because the first time you don't open, that's the beginning of the end. Uh, you know, you, you treat your customers the way you want to be treated when you, if you were buying from them. Uh, again, you know, sometimes on a hard day, that's hard to do, <laughs> you know, uh, because you just you get up, you're exasperated, you vent your frustrations on the customer, and, and he's not there for that. He doesn't care about your problems, and he shouldn't. He's there for you to take care of his problems. And, and, and so it's, it's just basic things that, uh, that we, we just take for granted or that we discard as cliches, but, but in the end, they're there what's going to determine and it's how you do it when you, when you have a setback. Because ultimately, I think, what I have found is, is it, it is your setbacks that define your successes. It is your defeats that define you. Tell me about that. I like that. Well, I mean, it, it is, what do you do with a setback? What do you do with a defeat? What do you do with a slap in the face? You know, as you referred to earlier when you were broaching the subject of uh, discrimination, you know, I mean, because it happens. How do you react then? It's going to ultimately determine whether you'll be successful or not. Because how you react then defines you. 
I've had discussions about integrity. And I've come to learn that integrity is something that you have defined. It's not something you define on the spot. It's, oh, no. and, and so that's what you're talking about a little bit, something that you've already defined, you know, how you're going to meet a challenge. Is, is, is that, am I going yeah, to? What are you going to do when, well, I, I tell my managers, you know, how would you decide this if nobody were looking? Yeah. Some people define that as integrity. Yes, if nobody ever knew that it was you who made this decision, what would you do? So in your company now, you're really growing people. You're really growing the people that are working for you. You know, Amanda, we hope so. We hope so. We like to think we are. Is that your desire? Is that your heart? Well, that's part of it. If I can turn, if after being associated with me, they're better citizens and they can better serve the communities they live in, specifically El Paso, but in all the communities that we serve, if they can go out and better serve those communities, then I guess I will have succeeded. How many states are you in now? Nine. And how many offices do you have? Well, we have about uh, 600. 600 offices, wow, and 3,000 employees. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a big organization. That's a big one. And uh, is that a lot of responsibility on your shoulders? Well, yes, because we feel that, that we have the same responsibility to each of our insureds, each of our insureds. So we, we have to be careful that, that something doesn't happen on our watch in some far-flung place, Atlanta, let's say, Chicago, that would impact the well-being of an El Paso employee, of a San Antonio employee, because everybody, every, each one of those employees is looking to us for their well-being. And it's unacceptable. I've, and, and my son and daughter and the officers of the company have bought this, have bought into this philosophy. It's unacceptable. I tell them, oh, well, you know what? I fell asleep. I got careless over here and there. We got ripped off to a degree that I got to let you go. Well, what happened? Where were you? You told me to be careful about my job, to take care of my responsibility, and you didn't do the same with yours. What happened? That's been a driving force in you, taking care of your family, taking care of others, making sure that you paid the bills. That's why you stayed up all night, making sure you could well, open the door. Well, that's how we did, yeah. Well, it sort of worked. <laughs> <clears throat> that's, a lasting, uh, that's a lasting image. It's, it's, it's an it's a enduring image. Uh, staying up all night to make sure you could open the next day. Uh, yeah. So that's carried through in... That was very important to us, yes. And um, so and how, how important is it for, for your employees to know your story? Uh, well, you know, I hate to say anything that tends to be self-serving or to give me more importance sure. than, than I really deserve. I, I, I think to the degree that they see what we have been able to do for them or what we're doing for them today is, is, is the importance that my story should have. Because we tell them, you know, what have you done for me lately? Don't tell me what you did yesterday. What did you do right now? And so it should be the same criteria that I adhere to. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday for them. It, it matters what I do today. You know, um, I, I work for a dear friend of yours, uh, um, Bill Tilney, you went yes. to you went to Long Beach State with him. Yes. He was president student body, I guess. Yeah, he was my student body president. And he was mayor here in El Paso, and I was a, his executive assistant. Yes. And and I'm using the story uh, now. Uh, see, I was the number two. Uh, before that, I'd been at the Chamber of Commerce, and I I know that as a chamber uh, employee, as an executive assistant to the mayor, your job is to be a very good number two, to make uh, your boss uh, look good to protect him to make sure he had the right information to to make sure he could do things with you know with with with, uh, with enough due diligence that he wasn't mm -hmm. out there going blind my, my job was to protect him but I, I look at the business owner and I'm hearing you talk and I'm I'm seeing the business owner is is a very good number two because the customer is number one the employees are number one and, and really, you're, you're, you're talking about being there for your employees. Oh, yes. And being there for your customers. Is that, is that fair, saying that you're really a good number two? Uh, yes, that I would like to say I am a good number two because I do put the interests of my 
customers and my employees first, yes. That I do. That I feel deep down as a primordial responsibility that I have. And you've always had that? Yes. Where did that come from? Well, I suppose you have to go back to what uh, my parents, my teachers. I was fortunate to have good teachers, nuns and clergy. And maybe, maybe to them, I don't know. But well, you went to Catholic school? Yes. And uh, that'd be interesting to, so how many uh, grandchildren now? How big is your Four. family? Four, no, it's still a small family. Four grandkids. Four grandkids and, and two children. Yes. Wow, that's nice. So you're a grandpa and you enjoy that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You, do you still exercise? You used to work out a lot. You know, I had a knee injury here in December and uh, that has severely curtailed my, my ability to exercise. I still walk every day. Uh, at home on the treadmill, but you know I, I had been now for a couple of years taking a, a, a step aerobics and kickboxing class at the Y every day. I mean, wow. This was a one-hour class every single day that I took, and, and I missed that. Oh. I've been able to do it now since December. So you're very active. You've always been active. Yes. Well, Mr. Loy, it's just a real, real thrill that you've taken time to share with us your your wonderful story. Um, but I think your experience is important, and, and the voice that you have in this community is very important. And I just want to tell you, you know, as much as you are, um, uh, as you agreed with me that the business owner is a good number two, you're really a number one, and I really oh, appreciate you. that. You're thank very you. kind, very and, and Mrs. Loya is very kind, and, and I, I really appreciate that. And I, and I trust that the, the view in public has, has had an opportunity to get a, a good sense of who you are and, and a lot of the value that you bring um, as a, as a person to this community. So I want to thank you again, Mr. Loya. Well, thank very you. Very appreciate it very much. Thank you. That's very gracious of you. Well, thank you very much for viewing, and have a good day.